Greetings, Starfighters. Episode 2 of Season 11 of Shameless Cash Grab. Physical Evidence. Burt Reynolds, Teresa Russell, Ned Beatty. Burt and Ned worked together on Deliverance, of course. Yada, yada, legal thriller. Um, <clears throat> so, if you've seen the community tab, you know that um, my, my aunt, who's... This, this, whose house, I was sharing this house with my aunt, and she uh, died a few weeks ago. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on details, but basically there's a chance that if this episode goes up in October instead of September, that's probably why, because, you know, you probably know that uh, my mom is also the editor of this show, and you know, she's Sandy's sister, and is in charge of, you know, handling the estate stuff. And obviously that is going to take priority over this show, especially since she does it gratis. Um, also, I don't really know what it means for the future of this show. Uh, it, I'm going to, I've already bought the sets for seasons uh, 12 and 13, so and uh, the rest of season 11, it, it's, the rest of season 11 is going to get made, 12 and 13 are going to get made. It's the when they will be coming out that is really up in the air. Because, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how much longer I'm going to be living here. And uh, that's why I've put sort of um, uh, non-shameless cash grab stuff on an indefinite hold, so you're not going to be seeing any uh, Let's Tries or tier ranking videos from me for a while. And I put up my last book video... Um, well, from what I'm recording this, I put the last book video up yesterday, and it's probably going to be the last book video, period, because I don't think people seem to be too interested in hearing me talk about books. It is what it is. Um, yeah, that's really all... I, th I think that's really all the stuff that's relevant to the people who watch this show. Um... Uh, probably, I'm a, uh, probably, I can't confirm it, but probably the rest of season 11, it's still going to feature this background that you know, um, uh, beyond that, I honestly have no idea. I don't know if I'll be able to afford to hire someone to do the title cards for seasons 12 and 13. I may have to try and do something there myself, like I did with seasons uh, 1, 2, and 3. Well, season 1, I used, like, Netflix's own Make It Stranger deal. Um, back, you know, back when I actually still cared about Stranger Things. And uh, if you know my politics at all, you know exactly why I don't anymore. Fucking Noah Schlapp, man. Just fuck that guy. Um, anyway... Free Palestine. So, anyway, yeah, uh, physical evidence. It, uh, I, like I said, this looks like it's going to be a legal thriller. And honestly, I, I hope that's all it is, because the little preview image on the back here that's only about yay big. But um, God, I'm really hoping that they're not trying. That this isn't going to be one of those erotic thrillers, because in my experience, erotic thrillers tend to be neither. So. Uh, yeah, all that out of the way, let's get into physical evidence. So yeah, not long after I filmed that video segment, uh, Mom got COVID, and I ended up not being able to watch the movie until the last week of September anyway, so this episode was always going to be an October release. <sighs> so, I watched Physical Evidence from 1989. Plot summary, courtesy of Letterboxd. A police officer, suspended and now accused of murder, is forced to join forces with his court-appointed attorney to assemble the pieces of a deadly puzzle to find the missing link before time runs out. Something I didn't pick up on when I was looking at the DVD case was that this movie was directed by Michael Crichton. Yes, the Michael Crichton who denied climate change and responded to one of his critics by making a character based on him in one of his novels, a pedophile with a micropenis. Oh, and he also wrote a book about dinosaurs where he mixed up Deinonychus and Velociraptor, which is something that society has yet to recover from. 
As for the movie itself, we open on a fairly peaceful sequence of nature sounds and soothing synth music playing as some people are loading barrels onto a boat. If I didn't already know what kind of movie we were in for from the back of the DVD, I might think this was the intro sequence to a rom-com or something. I mean, even the opening credits, including the font, give off ABC's TGIF vibes. If I had the time or the desire, I'd put up a video of this opening credit sequence with the theme song from Perfect Strangers or Hanging with Mr. Cooper over it. Not Sabrina the Teenage Witch, though. That one is too specific. And sitcom veteran Ted McGinley being in the supporting cast really only adds to all of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't say any of this to slag on the movie. Not yet, anyway. Just that I think that they were maybe being a little too on the nose setting up the total whiplash for when the inciting incident happens. Speaking of, a guy driving on a bridge comes to a stop, opens the trunk of his car to take out a noose and a paper sign that he writes happy now on before putting it around his neck and going to into the undergirders of the bridge or whatever you call them. I'm not a civil engineer. But before he can go through with it, he notices someone else under there who is already dead. A man whose throat has been slashed and deep. Like halfway to a full decapitation deep. And in a moment that ended up being funny, but almost certainly not on purpose, the already dead body and the guy about to hang himself fall off the side of the bridge together, but avoid ending up in the water when the noose catches around the living guy's ankle, leaving him there still holding onto the corpse, for some reason, while screaming for help. It's macabre, and like I said, was probably meant to be taken seriously, but I chuckled. I know, I'm terrible. Anyway, we then cut to two detectives going to the apartment of Burt Reynolds' character, Joe Paris, to find him passed out on the floor with a minor head wound. One of the detectives, the younger of the two, asks to look around the apartment. Paris says, sure, and goes to the bathroom to clean up. During this scene, the younger detective proceeds to berate Paris for not beating up a suspect using a racial slur in the process. Paris points out that the suspect was unarmed. The younger detective goes, he had a rap sheet longer than my dick. To which Paris goes, so he's never been arrested, huh? And the younger detective plants evidence on Paris for the murder of the guy from the opening. Okay, it's not that explicit. This movie is still, at least on paper, supposed to be a whodunit as opposed to a how catch him. But either the director told the actor to not be subtle, or the actor was just not good at being subtle because I clocked it right away. Paris gets arrested, and our story is in full swing. Only about seven minutes in, so points for not dawdling. We then cut to the public defender's office, and a lot of casual 1980s misogyny packed into about two minutes. But at the end of it, the case goes to Teresa Russell's character named Jennifer Hudson. We quickly go from there to her meeting with Paris at lockup. She tells Paris he's something of a celebrity because you, quote, don't see many liberal cops these days. The unarmed suspect reference earlier gets brought up again. What we learn here is that after Paris's partner had shot him, again, the, the man was unarmed, Paris nudged his partner hard enough to send him through a plate glass window. Hudson is being stoic here, but it, come ac it comes across more monotone and dull than serious and determined. It's why when she does snap at him for making a crack about her fiancé buying her a watch instead of a ring, calling him an arrogant asshole, it just feels forced. This does not bode well, because this is actually the main character of the movie. I mean, I know that her name comes second, and we don't meet her until after, but she really is the focus of the majority of this film. The dialogue between the two continues, and while Paris is kind of an ass, at least he feels like a character. Whereas with Hudson, I feel like if Teresa Russell was wearing glasses, I'd be able to see the reflection of cue cards in the lenses. Anyway, once the two start talking about the case, like adults, Paris admits he doesn't really remember anything about the night the victim was murdered. The victim, a guy named Farley, was a snitch that had worked with Paris from time to time, so that opens up the fields of suspects right there. The old of suspects. Fuck. I've done too many takes that line already. Move on. We go to the bail hearing scene, which takes place the next morning, and we meet the DA prosecuting the case, played by Ned Beatty. 
Bail is set after Hudson convinces the judge that Paris isn't a flight risk. Outside the courthouse, the DA, James Nix, tries to convince Hudson to plead out, not wanting to sensationalize the case. He also claims they found Paris's blood on the murder weapon. Hudson takes Paris to the bridge where the body was found, and to the club owned by Farley that is now run by his son, hoping to jog his memory. The son has already put his name up on the wall by the front door, even though his father only died two days prior, and the sign is in neon lights, so he's a suspect too, naturally. We then get a scene of a uniformed police officer with a hand tattoo, the camera makes sure we get a good look at, acting suspicious as Hudson and Paris get back in the car, but not where they could see him. He still takes off running after seeing them, though, which grabs their attention. They try to pursue, but he's able to get away in his car, with any potential pursuit being cut off by a passing truck. We cut to Hudson in bed at home, going through documents and books, and this is when her fiancé enters the picture, and he's played by Ted McGinley, one of the big that guys of the 80s. He seems quite nice and is very supportive of Hudson's career, saying he thinks she'll be Attorney General someday. Hudson admits she thinks Paris might be guilty. The next day, she goes to a bar and asks the bartender if he saw Paris there on the night of the murder, and he says he was there all night and that he had to be driven home due to the head injury. Speaking of, we learn here how he got it. It came after he got into a fight with a guy who had been pushing his presumed girlfriend around. The bartender says he doesn't know who either the man or the woman were as they weren't regulars, but Paris, despite being three sheets to the wind, was able to knock the man down. The bartender says he's willing to testify, and we then cut to him leaving the courtroom after having given a statement, and Hudson telling him she'll let him know when, the, when a trial date is set. Nix comes up to Hudson and tells her he thinks the bartender sounded coached. Hudson tells him to call off an illegal tale on her, mentioning the suspicious cop from before, and that a police cruiser followed her to the bar and from it to the courthouse. Nix insists he didn't do that, and to be honest, I kind of believe him. I mean, he might be lying, but depending on who exactly is behind the frame job, he may very well not be involved. I guess we'll find out soon enough. I wrote that line before watching the rest of the movie, by the way, and, um, no, we really don't. I'm serious. It's been, I've been thinking about it for several days, and I still have no clue how, if at, how involved, if at all, Nix was with the frame job. It, it's, completely up in the air. Anyway, later on, we're with Hudson at her home, going over the case, while her fiancé is off to attend a ball game with friends, when a mysterious woman comes to her house saying she's there to talk about Paris. It was actually during this bit that it occurred to me how little we'd seen of Burt Reynolds in the movie up to this point. In fact, it had been like 10 minutes since we'd seen him at all. That was when I came to the conclusion that this was actually, that Teresa Russell was actually the main character here. And, um... I guess the studio probably figured that the movie would do better if they gave Burt Reynolds top of billing. And, I mean, fair. I, I mean, I bet a number of you watching this went, who? The first time I mentioned Teresa Russell's name. And that makes sense, because, like, when I looked at her letterboxed page while I was taking notes, I saw that when sorted by popularity. The most famous movie she's been in is Spider-Man 3. And I don't remember her in Spider-Man 3. Anyway, this mysterious woman is married to a man named Vincent Quinn, who the DA has never been able to make anything stick to, but is a known entity to law enforcement. She also says her husband doesn't know that she knows Paris. Specifically, she says they met after Paris's wife had died two years ago, and that her husband had been abusing her at the time. She says that she had originally planned to have Farley kill her husband, but backed out. Farley wouldn't give her her money back, however, and played it, her a tape that he'd recorded of their meeting. You know, blackmail. Debbie, this is the wife's name, says that Paris did manage to get her money back from Farley, but that he was with her the night Farley died. Hudson is skeptical, understandably. Hudson goes to Paris' apartment and asks him point-blank if he'd coached the bartender. Paris tells her not to bring Deborah into this because if she gets on the witness stand as his alibi, her husband will have both of them killed, 
though he denies that he'd coached the bartender to lie to protect her, and insists he did still black out that night, though Hudson theorizes he does remember where he was the whole time, and that was with Deborah. She heads home, and her fiancé is there, watching TV, and suddenly being a jerk right the hell out of nowhere, and I can see where this is probably headed, and if I'm right, my groan is going to be loud enough to annoy the cats. He's being jealous about her having been talking to her client while he was home with Chinese food. It's only been a few days tops in the time frame of the movie, so this feels really forced. And it's so childish, too. He literally throws an egg roll at her, she mocks him for missing, and then he calls her a jerk. This scene is so dumb. We go to the next day, and we get a brief scene of Hudson walking past Nix, who made a condescending crack at her about the bartender being off the witness list, before going back to the conversation he was having before he saw her. We go from that brief scene to Paris walking into a police station, which we learn from moderately well-delivered exposition, was his old precinct before transferring downtown. His old captain clearly believes he's innocent, and lets him use his desk, telling him to just say he's working for him if anybody spots him. This would mean more if the desk wasn't in a room with large windows and a crowded precinct building, so he's already been seen by like a dozen people already, but the sentiment was nice. A uniformed officer walks in at this point and makes a speech, and honestly, it sounds the same as every whiny cop who throws a hissy fit on Twitter anytime a city budget dedicates money towards things like, you know, fixing bridges or keeping libraries open on weekends instead of being given to them to buy a tank or a flamethrower, so I already don't like this guy, and I don't even know his name yet. I just realized, I don't think I ever learned his name. I mean, I'm pretty sure they say it in the movie. I just, it just never sticks with me. It just never stuck with me. This goes nowhere as we cut to Paris going to some police office or something. Office or something, not office or something. Uh, when inside, while Paris and Hudson watch, a guy at a computer goes through a list of, a list of names and reads off their status as deceased over and over, prompting Paris to lament, I feel old. All my enemies are dead. Finally, they get to a name listed as being paroled instead of dead, which Paris is surprised by. We then go to a fish market where this guy works. Well, actually, he owns it, but I didn't realize, I didn't pick up on that until after the scene was over. Paris asks a secretary where the person is, uh, Harry Norton is the guy's name, to which she replies he's in Brazil on his honeymoon. Paris gets details on where by flirting with the secretary and... Man, I swear I've seen the actress playing the secretary in something before, but I just can't place her. Uh, hang on, let me check IMDb real quick. This is going to drive me bonkers if I don't. Okay, it looks like she did a lot of TV shows that I saw back in the late 80s and early 90s, so probably from one of those. Oh, she was on an episode of Captain Power. Oh, there's a throwback for you. Oh, right, this movie. Uh, and the cop framed for murder. Yeah, Paris leaves the fish market to see three guys leaning on his car. He calls one of them Eddie. Eddie scratches Paris's car with a hook, and Paris proceeds to beat the shit out of all three of them. We go from that to jury selection, and based on my own experiences, this part is actually pretty realistic. Though my selections were in Colorado and California, not Massachusetts. So maybe someone who's done jury duty in Boston would beg to differ. Before anyone asks, I've never been selected. Never even made it past voir dire. Anyway, after this, Paris goes to see Deborah at her and her husband's house, a pretty risky move, uh, chastising her for going to his lawyer and that he wants to keep her out of this. He asks her what happened that night, and she says that they drank until about 3 or 4 a.m. He asks her how he got the cut on his head, and she says he fell. He asks where, but all she says is, here. Neither of them see a man looking at them through a window. Deborah admits that when he'd showed up at her house that night, his shirt was covered in blood and he was already drunk and said he'd been in a fight. We go to Paris and Hudson having lunch. Hudson says she plans to put Deborah on the stand. Paris asks, what about Norton? Hudson says he's been out of the country and has no known link to Farley. She asks Paris if he has any enemies who are cops. He says lots, to which Hudson goes, does anybody like you? A line that might have been funny if it had been delivered better. We go from there to Paris greeting Harry Norton as he returns from Rio. 
Apparently, Norton did know Farley, saying he hadn't seen him for months, and wasn't too surprised to hear he was dead. He also tells Paris that if he has any questions, to talk to his lawyer. Now, in real life, everyone can and should do that if a cop wants to talk to them. But TV and movies operate under the premise that only bad people who've done bad things would ever invoke their Fifth Amendment rights. We transition from this scene by way of voiceover to the opening statements at the trial, including seeing the dead guy's kids. And I swear the guy playing Farley's son looks familiar too. Alright, checking IMDb again. Wow, this guy's been on even more TV shows I've watched. Usually for only one episode, but still. CSI, Stargate SG-1, Charmed, Smallville... The guy seems to have been working pretty steadily, until 2019 at least. Eh, good for him. Anyway, Matt Farley gets called to the stand as the prosecution's first witness. Hudson does a good job on Cross, bringing up that Matthew's father also knew a guy named Joe Parrish. Matthew starts yelling, making claims about tapes, yelling over the judge's calls for order, and telling him to only answer the question he's asked. During a sidebar, Hudson mentions there was no mention of tapes during Discovery, and Nick said he had no idea there were any until Farley's outburst. The judge grants a recess for the prosecution to find the tapes and to prove their authenticity before submitting them as evidence. We cut from that to the judge listening to one of the tapes, which has Paris threatening Farley if he doesn't give Deborah her money back. The tape is dated from a good six months before the murder, but the judge decides to allow it, but grants Hudson time to have an expert assess the tape's authenticity for herself, which Nix doesn't object to. Still, it looks pretty bad for Paris here. Shortly after this is where the Hudson giving the middle finger screenshot you've probably seen a few times came from, and I'm sorry, but in context, it just feels like an edgy preteen trying to act hardcore we go from there to Hudson at her office, reading transcripts when she gets a call from Nix about some new evidence that's going to blow her case wide open, and he tells her to meet him at a restaurant instead of hearing about it in court. She goes, and Nick's evidence is Paris's war record from Vietnam, specifically how when he killed for special forces, he would strangle his targets the way Farley had been strangled. And, well, strangled is a nice way of putting that. I still remember the opening of the movie. She points out it's circumstantial, Nick offers a plea deal again, murder too, and tells Hudson to stop trying to use this case to make a name for herself and put her client first, though he talks to her like a child as he says it. Which is not fair. Hudson is not a child. She might be an android like Data, the way Teresa Russell is playing her, but that's beside the point. Hudson uses a payphone to yell at Paris for lying to her before hanging up, though... I don't know if I would call not talking about what he did in Special Forces lying, especially if she never asked, which the movie hasn't shown us one way or the other. Hudson then notices a suspicious-looking man sitting in a cop car, apparently observing her, and the score tells us things are about to get serious. They don't. The car speeds off when she goes over to try and confront the supposed cop. Well, I mean, he might actually be a cop, but with this movie, it's not off the table, it's a guy in a costume. We then go to Hudson being called into her boss's office, and he yells at her for turning down the plea deal. She goes to find her place has been broken into and ransacked. While she's looking around, Paris walks in the front door. He tells her he just got there and that he owes her an explanation, but Hudson, shaking, clearly thinks he did this. He insists he didn't tell her about his war record because he thought it didn't matter, and she yells at him to leave. Her fiancé arrives and tells him to do the same. The fiancé's name is Kyle, which I am pretty sure we learn here, as opposed to earlier in the movie when we first met him. While Kyle is threatening Paris if he doesn't leave, the police and Nix burst in with a warrant. Hudson is yelling at everybody at this point, her client, her fiancé, and the DA, and honestly, I don't blame her. In fact, this is about the most human she seemed the whole movie. Kyle is being way more aggressive than he needs to be, Paris is sabotaging his own case to protect Deborah, and the DA treats her like a child. I'd be pissed too, honestly. Anyway, apparently someone stole a bunch of the Farley tapes from his son's place, and they were searching for them at Hudson's. Paris asks why they didn't check his place and car first, which Nick says they already did. Paris simply nods and says, oh. We go back to the courtroom in the next scene. A witness says he overheard Paris say that Farley would be taken out two days before the murder. He gets uncomfortable as he has to admit that pretty much all of Farley's associates spoke ill of him. Visibly uncomfortable. 
Like, no matter what the judge says, the jury is going to remember that. And people still buy into the pseudoscience of body language today, so imagine how much it was taken at face value in 1989. Like, yeah, in real life, the guy looking uncomfortable would not be proof of anything, but as far as this movie goes, it doesn't look great for him as a witness for the prosecution. At this point, Nix tries to enter the war record into evidence, but the judge doesn't go for it. We cut to that night, and Matt Farley accosts Hudson as she's trying to carry groceries into her house, yelling at her that she's ruining his reputation, and business is down at the club he inherited from his father because of her. Kyle comes out right as Farley's son is grabbing her head and tries to get him off her, but he manages to knock Kyle down and get his foot on Kyle's head before Hudson shoves him off. He takes off running, and Hudson has to hold Kyle back from trying to go after him. We go from that to a scene of Hudson practicing her opening statement that jump cuts into her giving it. A fairly common filmmaking technique, but handled well enough. She then calls Deborah as the first defense witness, which Paris is clearly not happy about. The DA sends his assistant out of the room, and before Deborah can start to go into detail about the night of the murder, he comes back with Deborah's husband. Oh, that is a dirty trick. At this point, I'm starting to get convinced that Nix is in on the frame job, too, but as I already said, it's still pretty up in the air by the end of the movie, and, you know, I don't think that was deliberate. I think that was just bad writing. Anyway, a recess is called, Paris is convinced that Hudson has just gotten Deborah killed, and effectively fires her as his lawyer, and Deborah's husband, his hand menacingly on the back of her neck, and her looking terrified, tells Hudson that he won't allow Deborah to perjure herself and that it was Hudson who came up with the alibi. We in the audience already know that's not true, of course. I like how the tension is building in this scene. Kind of a pity the rest of the movie wasn't like this, but I'll touch more on that in the final verdict section. We get another scene between Hudson and Kyle where he says he doesn't like what this case is doing to her. She asks what that is, and he says it's making her, and this is his word, mannish. Okay, yeah, fuck you, buddy. I don't want her to end up in a relationship with Paris at the end of the movie, but she definitely deserves better than you. Even if she's a robot merely approximating human emotion. After calling him out on selling junk bonds, which would mean more if she were to have also reported him to the SEC, but I digress, she ends the engagement. We go to Paris driving his car in the rain to Farley's club. While looking around, he hears a scuffle and sees a man with a gun fighting with a woman in a black dress over something. This results in the man and Paris taking shots at each other before the man takes the woman hostage and gets outside with Paris pursuing. And the rain has already stopped. That, that was quick. The man gets away with a box, but leaves the woman behind. I didn't recognize her at first, but she's the uh, but she's Matt Farley's girlfriend. She's okay and tells Paris to leave her alone, but he follows her into the club's office, where Matt Farley is sitting on the floor against the door, beaten up but alive. Paris goes to call a doctor. We then jump to the man who stole the box, and it's the guy with the tattoo that was dressed as a cop earlier, and he takes one of older Farley's blackmail tapes out and plays it. Paris gets behind him as he's getting ready to destroy the tape in Acid, a tape which has Farley talking to someone whose voice I don't recognize about moving stuff, and Tattoo Guy turns out to be the cop who was waxing whiny to Paris at his old precinct. And it turns out it was actually his voice on the blackmail tape. Silly, for, silly me for not picking up on that. But the cop insists that it was from 10 years ago and he's been clean ever since, which Paris doesn't buy. The cop says that Matt Farley was the one who killed his father and that he doubled the amount he wanted for blackmail. Paris asks the cop to hand over the tape, but the cop accidentally lets it slip into the jar of acid. Paris shoots the jar, but it's already too late. Paris takes the box and the remaining tapes in it and leaves. We cut to Hudson arriving home to see Paris sitting on her doorstep. He asks for her help, effectively rehiring her, and she starts to actually believe that he didn't kill Farley, and not just because it's her job. She asks him to help her pack up her things as she's moving out, so I guess this was actually Kyle's place. They talk about the case, we get some of Hudson's backstory, and then the romance starts. Ugh. Honestly, this movie would have been better off without it. But at least the movie's only got about 20 minutes left, so I don't have to put up with it for long. And eh, well, I'm closer to 25. Hudson gets a phone call from someone wanting to talk. Paris recognizes the name he gives and says the guy's a pathological liar, 
But she decides to go and check it out. He wants her to meet him at the prison's infirmary and to ask for the warden when she shows up. She arrives and the warden takes her to a prisoner who was on his second suicide attempt and he drops Harry Norton's name. Apparently Norton was involved with a woman named Celeste who went on to marry Farley instead. The dead one, not Matt. He admits that he'd rigged a car accident to kill both Farley and Celeste, but Farley survived it. And he, um, the informant, not, not Farley, ended up in prison before he could get another chance. Hudson asks who Norton hired to finish Harley off. This guy doesn't say, but is willing to offer proof in exchange for a deal. Hudson goes to talk to Nix, which honestly seems like a bad idea, but who else is there, I suppose? Nix doesn't go for it, and has a reasonable excuse for it, as the guy Hudson talked to does have a reputation for dishonesty, as Paris pointed out earlier. Later in court, the judge does grant Hudson a day to dig into the witness's claims, but if she doesn't come up with anything solid, he wants closing arguments from both sides within 48 hours. We cut back to the prison, where the guy claiming he'd had information on Norton is set up and garroted, but we don't see by who. We cut to the body being shown to Hudson, Paris, Nix, and someone else by the warden. Hudson suggests taking the body to the city hospital, hoping whoever killed him will think he failed, and Nix agrees to this. We go to Hudson's office, where Paris is working to edit some tape of this new dead guy's voice by using the recording of him that had been left on her answering machine. Not sure where he would have picked up this skill, but okay. Oh, yeah, and why was he going to Farley's club when it was closed earlier? Uh, anyway, they use the new recording, which of course sounds way cleaner than it would in real life, but that's normal for these kinds of movies, on the cop who'd burned the tape and acid earlier, and he threatens both the guy who is already dead and makes an implied threat to Hudson. We then see him open up a drawer full of guns. They then use the taped voice on Matt Farley, who reacts nervously before quietly hanging up. They use it on Norton after that. After playing it, Hudson gets on and claims they're planning to sue for assault. Norton claims he had nothing to do with the hit. Hudson asks how he knew there was a hit, and he claims he read it in the Herald. A waiting game begins, with Hudson and Paris in her office, and two uniformed officers posted outside by Nix. I still don't entirely buy that Nix isn't directly, in directly involved, so this could be a setup. Day turns into night, and none of the suspects have shown up yet. Hudson makes another phone call, and we cut to a panning shot as a phone rings, and we see Deborah's dead body. And then we see her husband's dead body as well. Okay, that was unexpected. We see someone plant a weapon in the husband's hand and take off. And it's someone in a police uniform. We don't see their face, so while it may be the cop with the tattoo, we probably have a surprise in store. Paris asks who Hudson was calling, and she says Deborah, but there was no answer. Of course, you already know why, since I just said... We see the car that left Deborah's house drive by the office, and Paris mistakes it from the window as another cop sent by Nix, and he worries that their killer will get scared off, but Hudson thinks their plan has already failed and is ready to call it a night. The killer does park and get out of his car, walking up to the two uniformed officers and shooting them both dead while they try to figure out which one of, th which one of them he is. Which one of their fellow officers he is. Yeah, that's, that's a better way to say it. The one in the driver's seat falls forward on the car, car horn, and it's blaring is what alerts Paris and Hudson that something is up. Paris heads downstairs with his gun while the killer walks towards the building. His casual gait and the way the score shifts makes this part seem like it came out of a slasher movie, which I don't think was intentional. I found myself doing the thing as I watched it. But uh, here's the twist. It wasn't actually the guy who killed the uniform officers, it was the cop with the tattoo. But after he enters the restaurant, he gets shot by, from behind by the actual killer, who is also in a cop uniform. Tattoo Guy says with his dying breath that he'd come to help Paris, and Paris takes off after the shooter, but gets shot and wounded in the process. The killer makes it up to Hudson's office, and we learn that it's Harry Norton. He pulls a gun on her and demands to know where the guy he'd actually gotten killed in prison is. So, obviously the tape worked in that aspect. Hudson is confused, as Norton was out of the country when Farley was killed, but he tells her he has a long reach and several scores to settle. She lies and says the guy is in the next building, and she'll take Norton to him. They get most of the way downstairs. 
When Norton glances out the front door and sees Paris to get about to get back up, or struggling to get back up, I guess I should say, he takes the gun off her to point at him, and she's able to hit him and deflect the shot. The two struggle, Norton drops the gun, she gets it, and manages to shoot him twice, though he is briefly able to grab a hold of her before dying in yet another moment that feels like it belongs in a horror movie instead of a murder mystery. And we end on a freeze frame. Yes, really. On Hudson smiling after making a quip about Paris not being able to do anything right, while he's still trying to stand up after getting shot. Random thoughts I had while watching the movie. 1. Oh, hey, Henry Mancini did the score. The guy did the score for The Great Mouse Detective, several of the Pink Panther movies, and Creature from the Black Lagoon. And, I learned from happenstance, the next movie we're looking at for this show. 2. I initially misheard Paris as Harris. Thankfully, I caught it soon enough I only had to fix a couple of paragraphs in my notes. 3. Props for this movie for remembering that there are, in fact, black people in Boston. 4. I've been watching Legal Eagle for too long. I keep going, you're not supposed to do that every time either the DA or Hudson approach the jury box. 5. I don't know Teresa Russell personally. Maybe she's a perfectly nice person. But, oy vey, her acting in this movie is practically begging for me to make fun of it. 6. I'm not kidding about the movie ending on a freeze frame, by the way. They really chose to end it like a sitcom episode. All that was missing was the laugh track. 7. Does it make the predictable romance at the end better or worse that we don't actually see them kiss? They do touch noses at one point, but honestly, that was done better by Sean and Juliet on Psych. Final verdict. Ultimately, two things hold this movie back from being something I could seriously recommend. Michael Crichton's directing, and Teresa Russell's acting. I've seen worse examples of both directing and acting, and not just for this show either. And honestly, I take like physical evidence of her, about 80% of the movies from season 7. But at the end of the day, Crichton is at best merely competent. I.e., there's no egregious problems with how scenes are shot, but nothing really stands out either. And Teresa Russell oftentimes feels like she's playing a Vulcan, and not in the good way that Leonard Nimoy, Tim Russ, or Gabrielle Ruiz do either, but in the annoying way that, like, pretty much every Vulcan character we got on Deep Space Nine behaved. Seriously, what do the writers of Deep Space Nine have against the Vulcans? Anyway, there's also the issue of the story for this movie. At first, I'd actually consider that to be one of the better aspects of the movie, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there were just too many loose threads. Now, sometimes such things are inevitable, and if the rest of the movie were better, I could have let some of this stuff slide. But as it is, I mean, like I asked earlier, why did Paris go to the club when it was closed? Why do we never see the detective who planted the murder weapon at Paris's apartment, or at least knew where to look for it again? Who was it at the prison who killed the guy Norton hired to kill Farley and his wife before? Why did Norton kill the Quins? Why did he do it himself? If Nix wasn't involved with the frame from the jump, why did he bring in Desbra's, Deborah's husband during the trial? Again, in a better made movie, some of this stuff wouldn't matter that much. But, eh. It's honestly as, if not more confusing than Seamus was. <sighs> well, next up in the Burt Reynolds collection, we get a movie whose plot description on the back of the DVD fills me with dread. But I'll get into that when we actually talk about the movie, titled The Man Who Loved Women. Have fun, stay safe, and to uh, any viewers I might have in North Carolina, I hope you didn't have to evacuate, but if you did, I hope you were able to get out okay. <laughs>